it's my great pleasure to introduce another member of the Johns Hopkins team. We were talking about how wonderful it is that Hopkins is such a strong center of the research, a leading force, and how it grows out of a tradition uh, of, of Johns Hopkins and, and Maryland, the Maryland Psychiatric Institute and Spring Grove's facility from the 60s and early 70s. And so that tradition's been going on. So I'm just in love with the, with the Hopkins program and the NYU program and all the rest of them as well. So um, it, it, I'm going to introduce Albert to you now. He's going to talk about optimizing psilocybin dosing, very important for clinical precision, the case for weight-adjusted dosing. The question was asked just yesterday about did you have different doses depending on weight. Albert Garcia um, <coughs> Romeo. PhD is a member of the psych psych sorry, Psychiatry and Behavioral Science Facility at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, where he studies the effect of psychedelic drugs in humans, with a focus on psilocybin as an aid in the treatment of addiction. He received his doctorate in psychology from the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology in Palo Alto, California, where he researched self-transcendence, meditation, and altered states of consciousness. Albert, please help me welcome Albert. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Neil, and uh, thank you all for being here. I know it's quite early, so <laughs> um, and I just want to also put in a plug for Horizons while I'm up here because uh, they were one of those places that when I was early on in my career, um, we were willing to host me to come speak about the research I was working on, and it's a, a great conference if you're happening to be based on the East Coast. So. Um, so, uh, again, <clears throat> uh, my name is Albert Garcia Romeo, and I work at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, and I'm going to be talking about uh, the dosing of psilocybin for clinical precision. And this is an important question because uh, we've just completed uh, a, a several phase two clinical trials where we've shown some pretty robust efficacy of psilocybin uh, for therapeutic uh, purposes uh, in a, a number of samples, most notably uh, with patients who have cancer and symptoms of depression and anxiety. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'd like to move forward with phase three clinical trials, which are very large scale, quite expensive, um, and would happen in a number of different institutions across the U.S. Uh, but in order to do that, we need to make sure that we have our logistics set up in terms of, you know, how are we going to do this so that it's uniform across all the sites. <clears throat> And so um, one of the main things uh, that we've been trying to figure out is what's the optimal dosing parameters that we can use to make sure that we get the best possible effects to move forward to get FDA approval. So let me pull out this. Uh, before we get uh, any further along, I just want to thank uh, my mentors, my colleagues, Matt Johnson there on the left of the screen, uh, Roland Griffiths on the right-hand side of the screen, Mary Cosimano in the middle there, as well as Maggie Kleindens, who sadly recently left her lab uh, for another job. But um, these, these fine people have been working in this area for much longer than I have, and, um, you know, it's been a pleasure to work with them. So I'd like to thank them and also Bill Richards, Fred Barrett, and a number of others in our team who aren't pictured here. But today we will be talking about uh, some pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics of psilocybin. And <clears throat> these are uh, kind of a mouthful, but the pharmacodynamics uh, are concerned with the way that a drug affects an organism. And on the other side of that coin, there's pharmacokinetics, uh, which is focusing on how the organism affects the drug. Uh, and so there's a back and forth here. There's a, a nice little tension between the two sides of this coin. Um, but the pharmacodynamics are concerned with how do the doses of a drug uh, affect the way that it, people um, are impacted by it. And uh, that's one of the major points of this, of this talk today. And then the other side is um, how does the organism affect the drug? And uh, if you take, for instance, a person who weighs 150 pounds and a person who weighs 300 pounds, and they both drink a six-pack of beer, they're going to have a different blood alcohol concentration, uh, and that's because they're going to metabolize that drug differently. And uh, so when we say how does an organism affect the drug, we're talking about some of these individual differences that uh, will 
uh, impact the way that the drug is metabolized and excreted. And body weight and BMI uh, are some of the major um, issues that are up uh, you know, for question right now with psilocybin. So um, another point that uh, is important, just as background information here, is the flat dosing uh, paradigm versus a weight-adjusted dosing model. And so there are different, uh, different ways of uh, altering the doses based on an individual's body weight or just using what they would call flat dosing. So if you're using a flat dosing model, what you're doing is everybody who walks in the door is going to get 30 milligrams of psilocybin. It doesn't matter if they're 300 pounds like myself or if they're, you know, 100 pounds like my wife. They're, you know, they're going to get the same exact dose. Uh, uh, the, heretofore, though, it's been uh, a weight-adjusted model has been really kind of the, the norm in the, most of the psilocybin research. And so uh, they've been using ind individualized dosing based on body weight, uh, not only in our lab, but lots of the other labs in Zurich and, and other uh, places in New York, for instance. So in that kind of model, we, we use a dose which can be a little confusing, but it's, for instance, 30 milligrams per 70 kilograms of body weight. Uh, for those of you who don't use the kilogram system, 70 kilograms is about 154 pounds. So using this 30 milligrams per 70 kilograms uh, dosing, uh, a person who comes into our laboratory who weighs 154 pounds would get a 30 milligram dose in their psilocybin session. Uh, but if a person come in, comes in and weighs 308 pounds or twice as much, they would receive a 60 milligram dose. And so this is the way we've been doing things pretty much since the late 90s. Uh, and uh, it's been pretty common for the research to use this uh, weight-adjusted dosing paradigm. And that includes, um, you know, some of our phase two clinical trials, including the one that was just published in the December 2016. You see some of the lovely artwork here from uh, Michael Pollan's trip treatment article, which was in The New Yorker uh, a year or two ago. And uh, that study was, uh, actually it was a part of a series of studies um, which was published uh, late last year um, with patients who had cancer and who also had uh, depression and anxiety related to that. So these were life-threatening cancer diagnoses, which uh, I'm sure if, if you're familiar with that, it's uh, somewhat psychologically distressing. And so we ran a randomized control trial concurrently with the team at NYU, uh, Steve Ross, Tony Bosses, Jeff Gus, and... and uh, uh, we did a couple of trials, uh, and those are actually on the uh, following up on the trial that was done at UCLA back in 2010-2011. And uh, the findings were very positive. Um, actually, most of the clinical findings with psilocybin have been pretty um, promising in terms of uh, showing some therapeutic efficacy. And so what you can see here is some of, the, some of the results from the study that was done at Johns Hopkins with cancer patients, showing that basically uh, the active treatment group who were there shown in the red bars five weeks after uh, their administration of a moderate dose of psilocybin uh, were having a significantly greater reduction of depression and anxiety uh, than a group who got a very low dose of psilocybin, which functioned as a control group in our study. Uh, and another area that I've been very interested in, and actually a lot of a lot of the researchers uh, in this area have been interested in as well, is that <clears throat> these uh, anti-anxiety and antidepressant effects were also mediated by the mystical type uh, qualities of the experience under the influence of psilocybin. Uh, so I'll talk a little more about this later. But when people have a moderate to high dose of psilocybin, um, there are certain qualities that are common for them to have. And among them are feelings of unity, feelings of sacredness, a feeling of uh, deeply felt positive mood, as we call it. And all of those feelings, uh, when they happen um, during the psilocybin session, seem to kind of drive some positive effects further on down the line, whether it be people who want to quit smoking or people who have uh, anxiety and depression uh, related to their cancer diagnosis. And so this is a nice, um, what we call mediation model, showing that um, the MEQ, or the Mystical Experience Questionnaire, scores that uh, are related to people's experience under the influence are then down the line uh, showing these effects on anxiety and depression. Uh, so 
it's a very interesting part of the, the research that the subjective effects of the drugs uh, seem to be uh, later on driving these therapeutic effects. It's not necessarily the same way with lots of other kinds of drugs. So if you take aspirin or Advil because you have a headache, you don't feel better because the drug makes you feel a certain way. It just uh, it works as a vasodilator and, and opens up the blood vessels and you're, you're fine. So it's mechanistic. Um, but this has a, a psychological component which is um, somewhat unusual for a lot of these therapeutic drugs. And, you know, that's also um, made it a little bit complicated to work on the development of these drugs as medications because um, <clears throat> they're not something that you just give somebody, you tell them to take it home and take it tomorrow and call me in the morning. Um, you know, there's a, a therapeutic aspect that's, that's involved. Um, there's a relationship with the therapist usually. That's actually my main, uh, my main job at Johns Hopkins is to sit with people and do counseling with them before and after these sessions and also sit through the sessions with them and help them process ex experience. And so it's a really important part uh, of, the, uh, of the treatment modality that people have positive experiences under the influence or that they have profound experiences. They sometimes are actually quite challenging, but they still be very meaningful. So, um, Getting back to the dosing question, you know, people are uh, right now, uh, even uh, as we speak, uh, talking about what's the best way to move forward with these big phase three clinical trials. So we did a couple of phase two clinical trials with cancer patients. I'm in the middle of doing a phase two clinical trial with smokers right now with Matt Johnson. And uh, we're trying to figure out when we do these big phase three clinical trials, as I mentioned, they're gonna be very large. They're gonna be happening all over the US. Um, and they're going to be expensive and, and you know, there's going to be a lot of people working on them. We want to make sure that they work as well as possible. So we're trying to figure out if the uh, flat dosing paradigm would be better than the weight adjusted dosing paradigm, uh, which we've been using thus far. Um, so the, the pros to using a flat dosing paradigm is that if everybody who walks in gets a 25 milligram pill, uh, obviously, that would be much easier than if we have to measure it out per, per every person who comes into the lab. Uh, also, it would be less expensive uh, because uh, pharmacists have to, you know, sit and do this, this you know, uh, labor to, to measure out the psilocybin quantities for the weight-adjusted dosing. Uh, so if we don't have to pay them to do that, we can just use 25 milligram pills for everyone who walks in the door. It will be easier and less expensive. Uh, and less time in intensive. So this is kind of the, the question that we've been wrestling with as we are planning this kind of new phase three uh, clinical trial, or these phase three clinical trials with psilocybin. So uh, to try to get a sense of whether flat dosing or weight adjusted dosing would be better, um, I took a, a big sample of some of the research um, that we've been doing at Hopkins, or that Roland and Matt and some of the others have been doing there since uh, 2000, and uh, just kind of pulled it all together. And uh, so that included seven different human studies um, administering psilocybin uh, with a, a total sample of 245 people. So there's 130 women and 115 men, which is a pretty good even split. Uh, and this is a range of different kinds of volunteers. So we had healthy, naive volunteers, the naive meaning that they hadn't really had much experience with hallucinogens prior to their laboratory experience. Uh, there's also healthy and experienced volunteers. So there's people who have had quite extensive experience outside of the lab. And we actually want those kinds of folks to come in because they can then tell us, you know, how does your lab experience compare to other experiences you've had outside of here? Uh, we've also done stuff with, as I mentioned, cancer patients, um, cigarette smokers who are trying to quit, um, novice meditators, so people who want to start a spiritual practice, uh, and also long-term meditators. So there's a whole different kind of uh, range of people who have been involved in these studies. Um, and there's 245 people. Um, those, those 245 people have actually had about 400 psilocybin sessions because many of them have more than one as part of our research protocols. But in order to get a clear statistical picture of what's going on, you have to kind of eliminate what we call repeated measures. Uh, and so there's just a single 
um, session per person, and it's uh, their highest dose that they received and their first, uh, their first exposure to that dose is what we're looking at here in some of these analyses that I'm about to show you. And the doses that we're using in these studies range from uh, what we call a moderate dose, uh, which is 22 milligrams per 70 kilograms body weight, up to a high dose, which is the highest dose we use, 30 milligrams per 70 kilograms body weight. Uh, and what we're uh, really interested in is just a few things, uh, because uh, you know this is a very simple question actually. Uh, looking at the dose, um, and so once you adjust for the weight, the doses that were actually administered to all these 245 people were between 15 milligrams and about 50 milligrams. So we had a nice big range of doses, a threefold range or more. Uh, and we wanted to know uh, how is that dose um, stacking up in terms of creating mystical type effects, which as I, as I had told you before, are, you know, seem to be driving a lot of our therapeutic benefits. Uh, challenging effects, which although, you know, when they're happening in the moment, it can be frightening or uh, difficult, uh, we're not actually sure whether or not these have any therapeutic benefit, but they, you know, there are, there are some data that suggest that this actually can be a positive thing. Uh, nevertheless, we're not trying to give people bad trips in the lab, and so we want to, you know, keep a, a measure of, of how much people are having a difficult time during their experiences and how the dose is related to that and just the intensity. And this is just a pure measure of how intense did you find that experience. Uh, so usually when you get this kind of data, which is, you know, 245 people, uh, you do a scatter plot just to take a look at it. You want to see, is there seem to be any relationship that you can see with the eyeballs um, without even having to do any statistical analyses. And so what you can see here is this is a mystical experience questionnaire scores uh, and the doses that were administered to people and with this sample of 245 individuals. And um, first of all, you can kind of see this line across the middle there, uh, which is pretty flat. And uh, that indicates that there's not any sort of linear relationship between uh, the dose and the mystical type effects of the drug. And so just to, to prepare you, I'm going to show you a bunch of null effects. Null effects are basically uh, no statistically significant relationships. So um, usually in science, we would consider that a, a bust. But uh, for our purposes, this is actually kind of interesting because uh, we're trying to figure out, again, the dosing parameters for future studies. Um, but, uh, you know, based on these data, it doesn't look like higher doses of psilocybin cause more mystical type effects. Um, also, based on these data, it doesn't look like, and, and this is a little bit closer to what we would consider statistically significant, although I ran, you know, probably about five dozen analyses on these, so if you corrected for all those analyses, this would really not, not fall in that, um, in that uh, wheelhouse of being statistically significant. But again, you can see really, there's people having challenging experiences all across the board, and so you can see uh, individuals like that one, for instance, who had a, low, a dose on the lower end of the spectrum, but also had uh, a considerably challenging experience. So uh, the challenging nature of the experience is not necessarily related to the dose that was administered. And finally, um, just looking at the intensity, you can see again that all, all the way across the, the range of doses between 20 and 50 milligrams, uh, or so, you're seeing people rating this uh, at level four of intensity, which is basically the highest level uh, that, we, that we're rating or that, that people are able to rate it in the lab. So the intensity, the challenging nature, and the mystical nature of the experience doesn't seem to be related to the dose. And this is just really kind of zoomed out, looking at a bunch of different studies and a bunch of different people. Um, so I wanted to zoom in a little more and do some more refined analyses. And again, spoiler alert, but what we found as we zoomed in further, closer and closer and did more and more careful analyses was it was no different than what I just showed you. And so uh, basically, uh, you know, the dose does not seem to be um, driving the mystical type effects, at least not within this, this uh, sweet spot between 22 and 30 milligrams per 70 kilograms. That all seems to be pretty 
uh, workable for people, uh, as far as we can tell. But um, so this is a mystical experience questionnaire score by dose with a sample subset of 167 people. So those 245 had a bunch of different doses, like I said, 22 milligrams per 70, up to 30 milligrams per 70 kilograms. Uh, these are all people who only got 30 milligrams per 70 kilograms. So we just took the people who got the highest dose that we administer in the laboratory, and then we, and we kind of focused in on them because we thought this would get rid of some of the noise uh, that you get when you're having all these multiple doses. And um, the red dots uh, are representative of, uh, we had Mary Cosimano who guided many of these sessions, and then myself who I guided to some of these sessions, go back kind of over our notes and figure out which were the sessions that seemed to be most challenging um, from our recollection, you know, where people really seemed to struggle, where people were having a difficult time, <clears throat> you know, based on our assessment, being there as an outside observer. And so we picked out um, what, what ended up being um, about 16 sessions out of these 167. So it's about 10% of these sessions were sessions that we considered difficult as the guides who were sitting in them. And those are those red dots that you see all over. And um, what's interesting again is you're seeing these red dots kind of all over from the left to the right hand of the spectrum. So regardless of the dose, you're seeing difficult experiences. And again, you're not seeing any significant relationship between the dose and the mystical type qualities of the, of the drug. Uh, so uh, you also see that with the challenging experience um, questionnaire, you can see we actually did a pretty good job of picking out the, the challenging experiences since most of our red dots are above that line. Um, <clears throat> and, but again, there's not a really a statistically significant uh, relationship there, which is also the case for, these, um, uh, for the intensity of the experience. So looking at these 167 people who had a high dose, um, there, there's no relationship that we could find uh, between their uh, dose and the intensity of the experience. So there's people who up here are rating it as extremely intense or as intense as they can rate it, but got a, the lower dose uh, on the spectrum. So in order to look at the question of flat dosing, and so the flat dosing paradigm, as I mentioned, is where everybody just gets the same dose, and we're um, trying to figure out, again, uh, whether it would be worthwhile to use a flat dosing paradigm for these larger trials. Uh, I took 50 people, um, as a, again, a subset, and they got a whole range of body weight adjusted doses, but their flat dose was all either 22, 23, or 24 milligrams. So basically, 23 milligrams was the mode uh, or the most commonly uh, administered uh, dose that we used in the lab out of all these sessions. And so I just kind of used the 23 milligrams as a, as a starting point, give or take, um, and looked at the relationship between mystical experience, challenging experience, and intensity. And again, what we are seeing is this flat curve. So there's not a statistically significant uh, relationship, regardless of how heavy the people are who get these doses. So there's people here on this spectrum who are 190 pounds getting 23 milligrams, and they're... Uh, mystical experience is no higher or lower than the people who weigh 120 pounds who are getting the same dose. Uh, and that's also true for the challenging experience. Uh, and that's also true for the uh, drug intensity. And so uh, looking at all those data, it really seems to suggest that perhaps a flat dosing paradigm may be uh, just as effective as the um, dosing uh, by body weight that we've been doing for all this time. Um, recently, there was also a study published out of the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Uh, this is Brown et al. It was published in 2017, so not long ago. Uh, and so this is showing some of the pharmacokinetics, um, looking at the concentration of psilocybin uh, in the body uh, over 24 hours after administration of, actually they used some very high doses. Uh, they went up to uh, 0.6 milligrams per kilogram, which is almost twice as much as we would usually use in the lab. And what you see is the blue line is representing uh, what was observed, and those dotted lines on the outside is representing what a simulation of using a 25 milligram flat dose would look like in terms of concentration. And what you see is that uh, that, that actually seems to fall pretty uh, close in terms of overlap. Uh, similarly, 
uh, looking at the the gray box, this is which are kind of uh, slanted parallelograms, if you will, uh, are showing the observed effects of this weight-adjusted dosing, whereas the green boxes are showing the simulated effects of a flat dose of 25 milligrams, and there's a quite a bit, good bit of overlap. And so that does seem to show that, mathematically speaking, um, it, we believe that using a flat dose would probably be comparable to using these weight-adjusted doses. Um, it's hard to tell why that might be the case, uh, one of the things that we do know is that as people have greater BMI or more are heavier, they also have more uh, serotonin 2A receptor binding uh, in the brain, and that's what these data are showing. Uh, and so it may be that people who are heavier might be more sensitive to these types of drugs, and so we don't have to give them higher doses. Um, the other good thing that we found out from these studies at Madison is that you can go up very high though without having bad effects. And so it wasn't harming anyone when uh, people had these high doses. Uh, I'm gonna move quickly because I'm out of time here, but uh, we did another uh, dose effects study uh, at Hopkins that was published in 2011 where 18 healthy volunteers got five different doses of psilocybin, five, 10, 20, and 30 milligrams per 70 kilograms and placebo. And what you saw was a really nice, if you look at the, the middle graph on the left, uh, is the overall drug effect was very nicely kind of uh, separated out by dose. So the higher the dose, the more the drug effect. And the other interesting point that we found there was that um, people had more increase in well-being and life satisfaction when they got the ascending dose sequence, meaning that they started low and went high. When people started high and went low, it was okay, but it it didn't seem to have the same positive ongoing effects. Um, and in that study, about 40% of the volunteers had difficult experiences uh, where they felt feelings of fear or feelings of fear of insanity. Uh, six of those cases were at that 30 milligram per 70 kilogram dose. Uh, one was at the 20 milligram per 70 kilogram dose. And so you see a six-fold increase in the um, you know, amount of difficult experiences when you move between those doses. Um, but there's only a small increase in the uh, mystical type effects. So uh, it's good to know that the 20 milligrams uh, is comparable to the 30 milligrams. I went back to the Good Friday experiment, which was one of the few studies to use the flat dosing with psilocybin. It was done in 1963, Walter Pankey, Tim Leary at Harvard. And we used the same questionnaire as they did, so it's good to know. And uh, the, the effects were comparable between the, the 30 milligram flat dose and then the 20 to 30 milligrams per 70 kilograms body weight adjusted doses that we used in the lab. So again, this suggests that um, a lot of these positive effects that we're seeing, whether it be antidepressant effects uh, from London, uh, anti-addiction um, effects out of uh, University of New Mexico, also out of Johns Hopkins, uh, are uh, creating um, these powerful, uh, profound effects that I've been conceptualizing as potentially inverse post-traumatic stress-like effects. So it's a single experience that has a lasting uh, positive benefit for people. Uh, and, um, you know, in conclusion, it seems that what we need to be doing is working to enhance and maximize the therapeutic outcomes of these drugs, so antidepressant or anti-addiction type effects, while minimizing some of these adverse effects, some of the challenging experiences people have. Um, we know uh, just from a logistical standpoint that flat dosing would be easier than weight-adjusted dosing for these big phase three clinical trials. And the data that we have looked at today suggests that the flat dosing may work just as well. So it may be easier and less expensive to use a flat dose of say, for instance, 25 milligrams to do these trials. But as always, more research is needed and I just wanted to say thanks to all the people who uh, fund our research, including the Hepta Research Institute, the Beckley Foundation, uh, National Institute on Drug Abuse, and you see a whole list of names there because we work with uh, a lot of people and they all make this work possible, including our uh, study participants. So, uh, and finally, thank you for coming. Like I said, I know it's quite early, so have a, have a great morning.
So once again, thank you so much for coming. I want to just say a final farewell to you all. Um, we'll see you in four years or less, I hope, and maybe at the after party for integration later this evening. Thank you all. Thank you one and all.